Well, good morning, everybody, on this absolutely glorious morning, and welcome to the Dorset Council Northern Area Planning Committee. I'm Councillor Sherry Jesperson, and I'm chair of this committee. This meeting is being live streamed to the public, and a copy of the recording will be available at a later date on the Dorset Council website. May I ask everyone to keep your microphones on mute unless you are actually speaking. Please use the chat facility to tell me you wish to speak. Just uh, put in RTS because the yellow uh, hands up function that we often use isn't available when, when we're on this particular version of Teams. Could you please not use the chat facility to chat among yourselves? Otherwise, I just get so confused. Um, I will try and introduce you each time you speak, but if I don't manage to do that, could you say your name so that the Minute Secretary and the members of the public know who is speaking? Um, this morning we have a reasonably short meeting, a short agenda this morning, particularly compared with uh, last week, last month's absolute marathon. So I'm not anticipating that we will be longer than our two hours. But should we need to, I will call a 15 minute break at an appropriate point during the course of this agenda so that everybody can um, get their breath. We will now take an alphabetical roll call of the members of, can of council who are with us here today. As I call your name, just unmute your microphone, indicate that you are present and then remute. Off we go then. Councillor John Andrews. I'm present. Councillor Tim Cook. Present. Councillor Les Fry. Good morning. Morning. Councillor Matt Hall. Present. Councillor Carol Jones. Present. Councillor Robin Legg. Present. Hello, Robin, and welcome, particular welcome to you, because I think this is the first meeting you've managed to join us to um, for a little while. So we're particularly pleased to see you this morning. Councillor Mary Penfold. Present. Councillor Bill. Bill Pipe. Present. Councillor Val Pothecary. Present. Councillor Belinda Rideout. Present. Councillor David Taylor. Present. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed. Good. So now for the benefit of the members of the public watching the meeting, I will, if I may, briefly explain the procedures. So for each application before us here this morning, I will invite the case officer to present their report and recommendations. Members of the public have been invited to submit written representations up to a maximum of 450 words. All of these submissions have been seen by members of the uh, committee. These submissions will be read to the committee by a council officer who has not been directly involved with the application and representations will be taken in this order. So three, the first three members of the public opposing the application, three members of the public supporting the applicant or agent, the town or parish council, and finally, the ward member, if they wish to speak, they can address the committee directly um, uh, online for a maximum of three minutes. So following the public representations, I will invite officers to clarify any points um, that have come up uh, and that members may raise. And then the committee will deliberate and come to a view. At the end of which, I will take a vote by roll call. And as I call your name, you will say for, against or abstain, or very straightforward. So moving on to our agenda then, item one, are there an, any apologies for absence? No, because you're all here, so that's excellent, thank you. Agenda item two, do any of you have any uh, de to declarations of interest on any of the items before us this morning? Just indicate in the chat box if you do. I'm seeing nothing, so that means none of you do, which is excellent. Agenda item three then, can we confirm the minutes of the meeting of the 23rd of June, the marathon meeting, are these a correct record? Just to keep it simple, could you just indicate in the chat box if you don't think the minutes are correct? I'm looking to see if anything, nothing is coming forward. I will take that then as agreement for the minutes. 
and I will take the minutes as a true record and sign them when the council finally opens and I can do that. Hello. Hello. Did you get my my chat box message to say that I wanted to query the minutes? No, I didn't get that chat box. Who is this speaking? It's Robin, Robin Legg. Um, it, can I just say that I'm given as an apology yes. for meeting. Can I ask that, because it wasn't just the last meeting that I was unable to get into for technical reasons. No, indeed. It's the meeting before that as well. And could it be clear in the minutes that the reason I'm uh, uh, giving apologies is because I'm not able to get in because it gives the, I think it gives the wrong impression as if you've gone on holiday or you're you've got some other activity which you think is more important. You're, you're absolutely right Councillor Legg and we know that you were trying very hard to participate in both of those meetings. Could we just uh, um, amend the minutes to that effect to, to make it clear that, that Councillor Legg was unable to attend for technical reasons? Yes, Chairman, that's noted. Thank you very much indeed. And that's a, a, a point well made, I think. Thank you very much. Um, so agenda item four, then public participation. And this is just for us to note the slightly revised, revised protocols for the public to address planning committees, which came into effect on the 20th of July and which we're working to today. So that's excellent. Um, moving on then to agenda item five. Agenda item 5A, our first application um, of the day. This is an application to develop land at Haywards Lane in Charles Oakford by the erection of 26 houses. Today, we are looking at the outline application to determine access. And I think it is, um, uh, 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 Simon McFarlane, who's going to be presenting this application to us today. Simon, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just will share my screen and upload the PowerPoint presentation. If you could just let me know that that's, that's arrived on screen. It's that arrived on screen. OK, fantastic. Do you want to put it in a slideshow format, Simon? Oh yeah, good idea. Um, how do I do that again? Should the be bottom the right. There we go. OK, uh, good morning, uh, councillors, members of the public. Um, this item is to develop the land by the erection of up to 26 dwellings to form vehicular access and pedestrian access and is for outline application to determine access only. This is the long range aerial view that shows the settlement of Child Oakford. The site is outlined in red at the southwest corner of the village. This is a zoomed in aerial view showing the site to the north of Haywards Lane and to the west of Allen Close. The site is surrounded by a mixture of residential dwellings built in varying eras. To the south of the site is the St Nicholas Primary School and to the west are agricultural fields. The site is currently in use for equestrian purposes and has not been in agricultural use since 2017. This photograph illustrates the view east to west down Haywards Lane. The proposed site entrance will be on the right hand side of this road in the picture and I'll come on to the exact details of that in a few slides time. You will note the presence of some parked cars on the left hand side of the road. This matter has been brought to the council's attention by several local residents who are concerned that parking here, especially in connection with the school pickups, and drop-offs is going to cause some danger and conflict with respect to the new proposed access. In order to address this point, the applicants have submitted a parking technical note. This summarised that the parking surveys that were carried out at peak school hours between the hours of 8 to 9.30 and 2.30 to 4pm in school term time. 
and the summary of these surveys concluded that there would be no severe impact upon the local road network and that the development would not exacerbate unacceptably the congestion on Haywards Lane. Just bear with me one second. Sorry about that. The highways team are therefore satisfied with this aspect of the application. This is the view west to east down Haywards Lane, um, illustrating the importance of the tall hedgerows and the rural character of this site and area. This view from Allen Close into the site illustrates two, two large walnut and oak trees. These will both be retained in the proposals. What will also be retained is a pedestrian access through this route although this will be for existing residents only as it's a permissive path through the site into the adjacent fields. This view within the site is looking towards Haywards Lane with the property named Winchards in the distance on the eastern boundary of the site. You see that the site is laid mainly, mainly to grass. This photo looks at the north and western boundaries and you can see that the boundaries are well screened with vegetation which will prevent any adverse impacts upon neighbouring properties. Behind the northern boundary are the properties in Chalwell and we believe that there's sufficient distance and vegetation to prevent any adverse overlooking or overshadowing on those properties. These views going west to east within the site towards the properties in Allen Close on the left hand picture and towards Winchards again in the right hand picture and Hambledon Hill, Hill in the background, which is roughly about 1.3 kilometres away to, to, the, to the top. These are the long range views from Hambledon Hill looking back across the village towards the site. This view goes across the AOMB the conclusion is that this view will remain largely unchanged due to the distance involved at around 1.3 kilometres and the intervening vegetation and existing properties, with only the tops of the roofs being visible within the site. The image to the right is the existing settlement boundary set out in the North Dorset local plan. The image on the left is the indication of the proposed rounding off of the settlement boundary, which on the balance of all material issues appears to be acceptable in officer's opinion. This slide shows the AOMB approximately 300 metres to the east. And given the distance and topography, there is very limited intervisibility between the two. The site lies between two landscape types, the rolling veils and the clay veil, but mostly within the rolling veils, which is the light green colour. One of the overall management objectives in this area is the conservation of the rural and tranquil area and nature of the area. Officers consider that this character can be respected through the development of this site. This is mainly through the retention of the majority of the hedgerows and trees on the site, which will be complemented with additional planting of native, native trees and landscaping and the provision of generous open space within the site, a distinct possibility. The site lies over 300 metres away from the nearest listed building and conservation area. And as with the AMB, there's very limited intervisibility between them and therefore there will be no harm to any of these heritage assets. The site was identified in 2012 in the North Dorset Schla, the Strategic Housing Land Availability Assessment. The council commented at that time that the site has potential to reflect the adjacent estates and has the potential for an estimated 25 dwellings. What's before you today is a development of up to 26 dwellings. Whilst this does not constitute policy or a formal application, allocation, it did indicate the council's view as to the potential acceptability of the principle for a residential development in this location. This is an image from the Child Oakwood Village Design Statement, 
which illustrates some important views and one which runs through the site from Allen Close to the open countryside. This view can be retained and accommodated in future reserve matters applications. Coming on to the illustrative master plan for the site, which demonstrates that up to 26 market and affordable dwellings, policy compliant parking and a generous amount of open space could be accommodated on the site whilst respecting the character of the area and nearby residential neighbours. There is also a parking area shown on the southeast boundary of the site. This was offered by the applicants in order to provide a further option to reduce on street school pick up and drop off parking at peak hours. It must be stressed, however, that this feature of the development is not necessary in planning or highways terms, given the evidence provided by the applicants on that topic. The access point off Haywards Lane and the pedestrian crossing point shown on the southern boundary are the only matters which permission is being sought for today. The highways team have raised no objections to these locations. Moving on to the trees and hedge matters, which are um, an important topic in this application. There was a provisional tree preservation order made on the 13th of July. Um, this protects all of the most important trees on the site. Um, and all of these trees that are shown in the tree, constra tree constraints plan in the proposals are retained. So none of these trees will be in danger. Um, this is the tree constraints plan. And you can see that they are all retained in the proposals. There has been some concern from local residents regarding the extent of the hedges to be removed, particularly on Haywards Lane. The tree protection plan illustrates that the only section of the hedge to be removed is to allow the access into the site. The areas of hedge within the visibility splay are to be cut back and trimmed rather than felled completely. However, in the event that this cutting back in reality does result in some hedgerow being removed and more hedgerow being removed than is currently shown, there is a planning condition which would secure its translocation or replanting behind the visibility splay where sufficient room exists to do so. The site is located within approximately a 700 metre walk of the village centre and is served by two bus stops providing routes into larger towns. And whilst the local services are relatively limited, they are what you would expect of a typical village, a local pub, a primary school, place of worship, village hall and a doctor's surgery. And therefore, this is considered to be a sustainable location. This plan is the only plan that would form an approved plan in the conditions list which indicates just the access and the pedestrian crossing on the south side of Haywards Lane. It has been confirmed that the pedestrian crossing on the south side of Haywards Lane is completely outside any private ownership and would not conflict with the concrete access into the field adjacent, a matter that was of some concern to local residents. And again, highways have no, raised no objections to, to these things. So in terms of uh, section 106 obligations that are being sought, uh, the applicant has agreed to provide the illustrated list of obligations, which I won't read out um, in full, but they include 40% affordable housing, which would be made available for local people, and in total around £16,000 per dwelling for a range of community, education and play facilities considered necessary to make this development acceptable. So in conclusion, the site is considered to be in a sustainable location without any formal designations and adjacent to the settlement boundary. It's been identified in the Council of Schlaw for approximately 25 dwellings. And given the fact that the Council cannot currently demonstrate a five year housing land supply, there's therefore a presumption in favour of sustainable development. The provision of up to 26 dwellings with 40% market affordable with all the necessary um, Section 106 obligations weighs heavily in favour. There are economic, social benefits and some minor environmental benefits 
and it's considered that there are no adverse impacts that would significantly and demonstrably outweigh these benefits when assessed against the policies in the National Planning Policy Framework taken as a whole. And therefore, officers have come to the recommendation that this application should be approved subject to Section 106 and conditions. Thank you, and back over to you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, Simon. Um, and now we move on to Steve Savage, who is the Transport Development Liaison Manager of Dorset Council, who will talk about the highways aspect of this application. Steve, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll just go over a number of the points that uh, your case officer has just mentioned. As you've heard, the proposed development will be served by a vehicular access located at could the we, Eastern... Could we have Steve on the screen live so we can see his face? I'm having technical difficulties, Chair. All right. If you bear okay. with me. All right. Steve, would you... We'll come to your face in a moment, but your voice is splendid anyway. Carry on. <laughs> it's probably he's, on he's on my screen, Chairman. He is, but he's not live. Carry on, Steve. OK, um, as you've heard, the uh, vehicular access to the site is at the east, located at the eastern end of the site frontage, along with a pedestrian access, which is also located at the eastern end. And that's on the slide before you. Visibility displays, you can just about make them out on the, um, the plan here. They've been provided and they fully accord with the recommendations um, provided by Manual for Streets, for a road subject to a 30 mile per hour speed limit. But allowing for the fact that in reality approach speeds from the west from the Shillingston direction can be above the speed limit, a visibility display in this direction is available, which is suitable for a 60 mile an hour approach speed. So we're happy with the visibility displays. Uh, in support of the application, a transport statement was submitted, which looked at the likely safety impact of the development on the surrounding road network. And a technical note was also submitted at the request of the Highway Authority that looked at the parking accumulation outside of the school on Haywards Lane during the school pick up and drop off times, primarily to ascertain whether the additional traffic generated by the development proposal would have a detrimental impact during these periods. With particular regard to these on-street parking issues, the report confirmed that the impact would be minimal, that vehicles could pass when necessary, there were no safety implications, and I agree with the findings of the technical note. Now, you may be interested to um, be aware of the predicted traffic movements from a development of this scale. 26 dwellings could be expected to generate around 13 two-way movements in the AM peak between 8 AM and 9 AM, and around 13 two-way movements in the PM peak between 5 and 6. A daily two-way uh, two flow, which is basically a 12-hour period between 7 and 7, of 129 vehicles is predicted. Now, as you can see on the plan before you, there's a pedestrian footway link provided at the eastern end of the site, which crosses the road immediately to the south to join up with a new footway extension and tactile crossing provided at the western side of the existing school entrance. And this will be provided fully at the applicant's expense. And as your case officer indicated, we believe this to all be located on highway land. So to sum up, Chair, the Highway Authority is the opinion that there are no highway safety issues presented by the proposal that can be recognised to be severe when consideration is given to paragraph 109 of the MPPF and consequently we've recommended a conditional approval. Thank you very much. Yes, very helpful, very clear. Thank you very much. Now, committee members will note that we've had a significant number of um, uh, submissions from the public on this and um, we are uh, going to uh, hear some of those read out. Um, and Alison Sharp, who is Democratic Services Officer, is our reader for the day. So, Alison, if you'd like to um, read the first of our public statements. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mark Kerridge, objecting. I strongly object to the key transport statement. The officers have suggested that the traffic is not severe according to NPPF. How on earth can this be correct? Surely common sense must prevail. Please see the photographs of my objection dated 13th of March, the documents tab. There has been no consideration or account taken of the speed vehicles travel along Haywards Lane, the danger this poses to parents and young children. The technical note and date of submission was not made public. 
We cannot confirm this was submitted before the inclusion of the car park and the impact of the additional highway movements. The traffic report submitted certainly does not and cannot be relied upon. It was completed during the school holidays, August 2018. It has not been updated. The application is for two access points, not one single as stated. There are already seven access points within 50 yards that have not been considered. The road is a country lane, not sufficiently wide enough during peak school hours to accommodate all the traffic movements during those hours. See same photographs. The provision of a car park and school crossing are not justification to approve the application. There is no section 106 to guarantee delivery of either. There is no guarantee the car park will be used by school parents as it is significantly less convenient. No consideration has been given to prevent any parking along Haywards Lane by the highways or applicant. Despite an email exchange with the case officer, it has not been proved beyond reasonable doubt that the land on the south side of Haywards Lane by school is completely owned by highways to enable the provision of the footway. There is an existing concrete access road to our property and the footpath construction will conflict with that ownership. The footpath cannot be delivered. The application should, could be subject to legal challenge. The footway on the southern side does not form part of the application. It is outside of the application red line. Child Oakford is a rural village. This development is contrary to the Strategic Landscape and Heritage Study for North Dorset Area, October 2019, 2019 beg your pardon, guidance for the new Dorset plan specifically for Child Oakford. Avoid locating de development, development where it may block views to landmark skyline features. Retain the strong, over, overall strongly rural and highly tranquil character of the village and its surrounds. Ensure any new development does not adversely affect the special qualities of Dorset AONB, including uninterrupted panoramic views. This application is a speculative development and the planning officer has adopted a simplistic approach in applying Dorset's lack of five-year housing supply to completely override the full application of national and local planning policy. David Taylor, objecting. Paragraph 3.0. Can I just interrupt a second and ask, we've got, um, a very, uh, very tinny quality to this audio from Alison, who's reading very nicely. Is there anything we can do about that? I'm not sure that we can, Chairman. Right. Could we, we try a few, Sorry, we are having a few technical issues this morning. That, yes, don't I, I see we are because you've all just disappeared from my screen here, which is uh, uh, disappointing. Um, uh, I I wonder, Alison, if you could try um, without the headphones. Um, I can try, but I'm not certain that it will actually work, I'm afraid, but I'll certainly try. Let's see. Uh, it's just that we've got a lot to hear from you yeah. and um, this the, the quality that audio quality is probably a little bit suboptimal and i i'm very aware of the fact that this is the comments from the public yes. and we need we i need to be confident on behalf of the public that everyone can hear this really clearly yeah. um do, do you think going without the headphones might help uh, officers other than alison give it a go and see if yes. that's better okay. No, no. <laughs> I think I'm afraid my computer doesn't um, have a microphone that, that functions. It's on its own. So that's not going to work then. No. Um, I I don't think we continue can continue with this level of audio. It's okay. Given Sherry. 
Yes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, uh, this Robert. This is Rob, Robert, Robert Lennis, yeah. lead planning officer. Mm -hmm. Sherry, could you try, I'm uh, not Sherry, uh, Allison, try mm -hmm. taking the microphone a bit further away from your mouth. Yeah, how's that? How is that? That's better. A bit oh, better. Raise good. it up a bit so it's not directly, in, so it's either below your chin. Yes. How's now that? Tom. How's that? Does that sound better? It, yes. It does. It does sound better. That that if you if that if you speak, you'll have to speak louder now because yes. it's further away from you. Okay. But I think we could. That's acceptable. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you, Robert. Carry on, Alison, with your next submission from members of the public. Okay, thank, thank you. you. David Taylor objecting. Paragraph three point naught of the report to the committee states that. There are no material considerations which would warrant refusal of the application. The residential amenity section states that the site is only visible from three adjacent residential dwellings. There are eight neighbouring dwellings. Winchards, three, five and six Allen Close and 12, 13, 14 and 15 Chalwell. They all share a land boundary with the proposed site and have south and west facing windows and low boundary fences in order to take advantage of the vistas across the countryside at the edge of the village, the dark night skies and the stunning sunsets. The properties in Chalwell are not shown on the proposed site plan sketch proposal and LVIA. Development of this site will result in noise and pollution from the extensive car parking provision. The access road is particularly poorly situated and will result in headlights shining directly into the main living spaces of Winchards and the three properties in Allen Close. The properties in Chalwell will also suffer from overshadowing and overlooking. The proposed density will result in overdevelopment of the site, which will be cramped and share a poor relationship with neighbouring properties, resulting in substantial loss of amenity for the existing residents. Paragraph six of the report states the application contains a mix of two, three and four bedroom properties. The sketch proposal, Rev 1, shows that there are no longer any two bed properties on site. The sketch proposal shows the addition of a notional car park and a new pedestrian access. These are substantial changes to the original proposals and the statutory consultees and the public were not reconsulted when these material changes were made. The design and access statement and the transport statement have not been updated to take account of these changes. The transport statement does not reflect the additional vehicular and pedestrian trips generated by the school car park and new pedestrian access. Paragraph six states that the site retains the footpath which enters the site from Allen Close and runs to the western site boundary and maintains an established right of way through the site for existing residents. This footpath does not exist and there is no established right of way. The land is privately owned and the farm gate at the end of Allen Close is kept padlocked. The proposed pedestrian access through Allen Close should be refused. The documentation is inaccurate, incomplete and unprofessional. If the planning committee were to approve this speculative proposal, it would set a precedent for the village as it is on a greenfield site and outside of the village settlement boundary and would open the floodgates to even more major applications. Hetty Rutledge objecting. 
the applicants make no mention of the child Oakford village design statement COBS in any of their documentation, including the planning statement. The COBS expresses the wishes of our villagers, both adults and children, in relation to the design and location of any future proposals for housing. This is the first major planning application to be submitted since the COVTS was adopted by the former North Dorset District Council. It is a supplementary policy to the North Dorset local plan and is a material consideration in the planning process. The overwhelming sentiment of the village is that Child Oakford is a rural community and that is how we want it to remain. The statement says that the village settlement boundary is not only a statutory boundary, but also a physical and environmental one. In order to maintain the prerequisite rural character of the community, the integrity of the village settlement boundary should be sacrosanct. The geographical constraints that naturally limit growth Hambledon Hill to the east and the River Stour to the west enforce this tenet. The statement goes on to say that any growth must occur through redevelopment of existing dwellings with the constraints of the village settlement with constraints of the village settlement boundary. The statement goes on to say that the vast majority of building ground with the village settlement boundary has been developed and the population is close to the maximum size that the infrastructure can sustain. And any major expansion in the village would need a concomitant increase in infrastructure. This would result in much greater urbanization and loss of essential rural character which is the main reason why the majority of the residents live in the village. If the villagers wanted to live in an urban or suburban environment, they would move to one or not come to Child Oakford. In its recommendations, the COVTS says that the village settlement boundary, as it is presently defined, should not be altered to include any more greenfield sites and valuable agricultural land. This is a speculative application and the applicants did not therefore hold any public consultation prior to its submission, nor did they enter pre-planning discussions with Dorset Council. Dorset Council must defend and implement their own policies with respect and respect the wishes of the villagers of Child Oakford. As several, several objectors have said, when does a large village become a town? The answer is when the council approves speculative planning applications outside of a village settlement boundary in the countryside and on va valuable agricultural land. That is all the public comments, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and that, then we have next is a comment then from Child Oakford Parish Council. Child Oakford Parish Council. The parish is rightly concerned for the inconsistent approach applied by the district to the matter of five year housing supply. We recently supported the council in an appeal at Child Oakford where the council's key defence is an appropriate level of housing supply. A fortnight later, this proposal is recommended for approval on grounds the supply is inadequate. The officer report selects economically those elements that fit a desired outcome, rather than assess all matters, material in a true planning balance before a decision is reached. We are faced with a paradox when considered against the approach to other proposals in the village. No explanation is offered to justify why so many matters are left for later determination or why 
this proposal is treated differently from others. There is no confidence the recommendation is made for sound planning reasons. We have drawn attention to material changes to the proposal. For example, access and change site boundary, which should but have not been sub subject to further consultation. Site access remains unresolved in terms of design and delivery. However, a Grampian condition is recommended despite no reasonable certainty access works will meet appropriate standards or be accomplished either by the developer or others. The applicant proposes surface water disposal via SUDS without evidence of groundwater effects and consequential drainage impacts elsewhere in the village. These three concerns alongside the matters brushed aside for later approval through condition alone or in combination raise considerable doubt the site can be developed satisfactorily and the presumption in favour of development cannot be confirmed. Without resolution, each and every matter subject to condition justifies refusal and any approval made is unsound and open to legal challenge. This proposal should be deferred to allow the full assessment of outstanding matters before any decision is recommended. Approval in the form recommended will remove the Council's ability to manage planning decisions for housing across the district. The recommendation provides no certainty the proposal will be implemented in accordance with submitted proposals and importantly within any reasonable time scale. There is no guarantee it will deliver the very housing need which it uses to justify a departure from adopted planning policy. The committee should defer this application not only to allow the submission of evidence on matters conditioned, but also to take account of an imminent appeal decision in the village, which will clarify the housing land supply situation. If a need is proven, it may be appropriate to consider this site as an option, subject to all matters being demonstrably resolved satisfactorily. Committee should not be swayed by the offers of a legal agreement to reach a decision prematurely. Contributions will be forthcoming equally once all outstanding material considerations are resolved. That's all, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now the, the ward member is me, so um, I'm not going to make my remarks now. I'm going to um, make my remarks as part of the committee deliberation. Um, so we're moving on then to the uh, response from the ap the applicant's agent. Uh, and again, Alison, that's with you. I'm afraid more reading. You're nearly done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Giles Moyer, agent support. This statement is made on behalf of the applicants, ELT Bournemouth, in support of the officer's recommendation. The applicants, having worked tirelessly with officers, are pleased to see that the application has been recommended for approval. This recommendation reflects the proactive response of the applicants in responding to and addressing officers' comments and feedback. The proposal has evolved since first submitted. These most notable changes including include a reduction in the number of proposed units from 32 to 26 dwellings and the incorporation of a parking drop-off area for the school. This proposed parking area is not required to mitigate any impact from the proposal, but is offered as an opportunity to improve highway safety providing an alternative location for parents to park rather than on the road during school drop-off and pick-up times. 
The site sits to the north of Haywards Lane, forming the site's south southern boundary. The site's northern and eastern boundaries are made up of established residential developments. It is important to note that these properties, forming the northern and eastern boundaries, are not isolated properties, but formally laid out housing developments. The proposal reads as a natural extension to Child Oakford, rounding off the existing settlement. The established planting and landscaping features which make up the site boundaries will be retained. This allows for the successful integration of the proposal into the adjacent settlement. The landscape visual impact assessment submitted in support of the application concludes that the proposal will not have any significant effect on views from the AONB, with only a small part of the site being visible from distant views and appearing as a, a few more roofs interspersed with mature trees. The properties which form the site's northern and eastern boundaries are made up of detached, semi-detached and terraced properties. The principal character of the area is that of housing arranged in a cul-de-sac form with the cul-de-sac extending from the principal routes. The proposed layout demonstrates that a mix of housing can be provided within the site, which is reflective of established settlement pattern, retaining the same degree of separation distances and built form to landscaping ratio. The proposal will deliver 40% affordable housing on site, together with contributions in, in excess of £16,000 per dwelling towards local community, education and play facilities. As detailed in the officer's report, the principle of development is considered to be acceptable in light of the lack of five-year housing land supply and the site's location adjacent to the settlement boundary. The proposal will make a significant contribution towards the Council's identified housing need, delivering 40%, 10 affordable units. It is hoped that members support the officer's recommendation and approve the application. That's all, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed, Alison, and that was very well read. That was rather rather a, a, a lot of reading for you. Thank you very much. Um, I mentioned that I am the ward member. It is my practice, as you know, to go first to the ward member um, for questions and uh, before I go to other members of the committee. And I intend to extend myself that same courtesy. But before I um, ask the few questions that I have, I want to ask uh, the Vice Chairman, um, uh, Councillor Mary Penfold, because I know she has a very pertinent question that she wants to ask with regard to the, the car park. So Mary, would you like to start with your question, please? And then I'll come back to myself. Mary, you're muted. Thank you. Vice Chairman, you're still muted. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. I can now. Right. Um, several questions, Chairman, if that's all right, please. Yes. Um, the first one is a point of clarification. Um, the, the car park doesn't form part of the actual application, does it? Could somebody answer that for me, please? Uh, Simon, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> no, no, in effect, it, it doesn't. Um, because the application is for outline um, and access consideration only, it's, it's merely illustrative. Thank you. Thank Mary. you very much. Um, looking at the evidence, I can't see that there is support for a car park. Um, were the villagers asked um, um, their views on this or the parish council specifically on the car park? Uh, um, Councillor, I feel the need to stress the point that what we're looking at is an illustrative drawing. Right. OK. Yes. So that land is part of the site and 
it's showing the suitability of the site for up to 26 houses. Now the car parking does not need to be a part of the detailed layout. Right. Okay. So the direct answer is no, nobody was surveyed or questioned within the village. Uh, the issue of parking was raised. And as a matter of due diligence, the applicant in, in good faith with officers had looked at various illustrative layouts like you see today. Yes. To see that if it did become an issue, could it be accommodated? Right. Uh, does, I mean, that, does that answer? Thank, thank you. That goes. It's just that um, living in a village myself, um, I, I think, you know, who would be responsible for its upkeep and um, who will actually own it and, and questions like that. But I, I quite understand um, that obviously this is an illustrative layout. Um, but do we address the principle? Is the development acceptable with or without a car park? I think that's a, that's a, an extremely yeah. pertinent question, Mary, because that's um, that comes to the, the one of the queries that I was going to raise about. It seems to me as the ward member that this car park is not necessarily at all helpful um, and it, it doesn't see, appear to be central to this application. And so I, I would like to propose that we, we, we kind of need to tidy this car park, this, this matter of the car park up a little bit um, before we go forward. Um, it, is, it is cited um, in a couple of places in this application as um, part of the planning gain, but, there, but there's no evidence given for that. And, and I, um, there's no evidence that of a need for this car park. There's no uh, no evidence brought forward at this point. Um, so I, I I'm going to make a proposal. I think uh, uh, in due course uh, that we that we might put an informative note regarding um, the, this car park at this point um, and perhaps um, set it set it on one side and consider the. Um, application before us without getting too bogged down on on the matter of this car park. Does that does that seem a reasonable approach, colleagues? Yes. 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 Good. Yes. Good. Thank you very much. Good. Um, we we will we will then come back to the car park. If I may, then before I go on to other members, as I said, extend myself the same courtesy as I do to the rest of you, um, and and as ward member, ask a few of my questions first. Um, the first question I have to ask is about the link through uh, the site from the site to Allen Close. It's not clear to me what uh, the sixth paragraph on page 34 means. Um, it, the language is a bit unclear. Cur currently, there is no access from Allen Close onto this site. There is a padlocked gate, um, but no right of way. Um, into this field. You made reference to a permissive path. Um, the Parish Council are not aware and the residents of Allen Close are not aware because I did ask that there is a permissive path, but if if there is a permissive path, it's not open, it's not available. Um, so I would like to just clarify what is being proposed here with this access. Uh, you appear to be implying that it is um, access in one direction. I'm not quite sure how that would work. Could you just clarify for me what this proposal contains in terms of this pedestrian access between the site and Allen Close? Thank you. Simon. Yeah. Hi, Chair. Um, yeah, I think the applicants believed that there could be a permissive path that runs from Allen Close through the site into the fields adjacent um, there is a very um, faint line shown on the constraints map of a path. Um, it's believed that one of the neighbours has um, has a covenant or some ownership um, that would prevent that access being used as a formal access for the proposed development. Therefore, it's the applicant's intention to retain this path um, as it's been existing for use for anybody that does use it. Um, but then also create the pedestrian access to the south of the site onto Haywards Lane to avoid any legal conflict. Okay, 
members might want to pick that up. I, I, I understand what you're saying, but it seems to me that we are looking today at access and that includes that um, pedestrian access into Allen Close. And, and notwithstanding your answer, for which thank you very much, I'm still not clear whether or not we are in a position to um, give a, 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 a permission for an access. We No such access currently exists. And I don't think we know who owns the land, the other side of the locked gate. Yeah, I'm concerned I mean, that we are saying yes to something when we're not clear what we're saying yet. We, we might be saying <coughs> yes to something when we're not clear what we're saying yes to. And we're probably not in a position to say yes anyway. Could we uh, clap? Chair, can I pick up on yes, that point? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, I would suggest that in the first instant, you look at the red line boundary as being discrete. Yeah. And the first question is, can the number of houses that they're proposing fit here? And clearly that has been demonstrated. The next point are the constraints that we're addressing with regards to access. Would the issue you're raising prevent the development coming forward? In my own opinion, I can't see how it would if in the first instance, let's imagine the right of access didn't exist and they built a fence or put up a hedge there. Um, in the second instance, if there is this right of access, then some form of a gate would need to be provided there. And uh, it, it, it wouldn't, it would have to be demonstrated, not demonstrated, you would have to sign, put a sign up to say this is not a right of access, but much like we have other development in fields that have open boundaries, people cross there um, and it's it's it needs to be a matter of judgment of whether this particular access is going to be detrimental to um, the residents of the neighboring property. The access will remain because you could have a gate, a kissing gate that opens one way or some other. There's there are, there are ways of overcoming this particular issue you're raising, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. Thank you, Chair. OK, I, 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 that's very helpful. I'm still concerned that I would like to make sure by the end of this meeting that we're absolutely clear what permission we have given and what we have deferred until later with regard to this access point. I think that I'll leave it at that. Sure. Um, my, yes. Sorry, can I, can I yes, assist please you? Please do, Steve, yes. Um, it, my understanding that the footway linked to Alan Close um, was an indicative opportunity. I think that's how the right. applicant described it. Uh, okay. Because the land isn't in the control of the applicant, as a highway authority, we haven't considered that as being right. the pedestrian link. We're of the opinion that the southern pedestrian link that um, Simon mentioned onto Haywards Lane is sufficient to provide pedestrian permeability to the town's facilities, so right. villages facilities. So we've never deemed that as being an essential pedestrian link and it is not in the applicant's control. Right. Could we make sure then that the minutes show that that's very helpful? Thank you, Steve, because because I need to, I want us to be absolutely clear what we may or may not say yes to today with regard to, to, to that link, because I think it's it's um, it's it presented as re, as slightly more straightforward in the uh, report before us than it perhaps is. So I'm satisfied with that answer. Thank you very much. Could I move on to my next question then, which is in the section 106 heads of terms on page 43, paragraph 14. Now this includes an allocation for allotments on site. Um, there's a, in the indicative, and I, it's an indicative um, design, but there is no inclusion of allotments on site in, in that indicative layout. Uh, there's no indication that um, uh, in allotments on site would, would be an attractive proposition. The village have, have not indicated that they would want allotments on site. There. Could we, again, could I just ask that this gets tidied up? There are there is sufficient allotment provision within the village of Child Oakford already should the committee decide to give permission for this. And I think the, the view of the village is that that reference to allotments on site at this point is unhelpful. So again, could we just clarify that? Because the, the, um, if otherwise it will just go forward as something 
that everybody's happy with and, and they're not. Hi, Chair. Yes. Thanks for your question. Um, yeah, the wording on the slide was um, it's actually in incorrect. And what's followed through into the drafting of the draft 106 is that the provision would be made on site and off site. So there would be a contribution, I think, of around about £308 off site. And then there was mention of a certain square meterage on site. That's actually just a drafting mistake and right. it should have been and or. So when the legal agreement is finalised, it will be clear that the any provision that is sought will only be for a financial contribution off site and not on site. Massively helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Super. That's that's really helpful. Um, my third question then is on the there's reference to a newly dedicated footpath from Netmead Lane in your report. Not clear to me what that refers to. Could, could I have some clarification on that one? I'll try and find the page if you're struggling with that. Uh, Simon, uh, cl clarification on what the reference is in the, that's again in the section 106 um, to, to a sum of money for a newly dedicated footpath from Netmead Lane. Which footpath is this? Just bear with me once. Thank second. you. Thank you. OK, th this was a um, contribution request from the our rights of way officer for um, for ten thousand pounds and the resurfacing resurfacing of a uh, public right of way, uh, which is to the north of the development and links to the Brider Way. Um, numbered N35 stroke 20, um, which goes on to Haywards Lane near Greenway. Um, so local local highway um, pedestrian footpath uh, improvements. All right, and that, that will be from with it from the site to this footpath, will it? Because it's um, could I could I see that on the plans? I'm asking this on behalf of that. that it, I've been asked to ask this because the residents weren't clear about this as well. So we do need to just clarify this. Could could we see the plans again? Simon, we've stopped sharing the plans for some reason. You need to share your screen again, please. Yeah. Thanks, Simon. Okay. Take the, your time. The actual um, right away isn't shown on the presentation, but if I could just have a minute to try and try and locate it so I could show you. Um, yes, it, absolutely. Have your minute. Sorry, I slightly banked this on you. I did try and give officers advance notice of these tricky questions. While Simon's do that, I will just say to members, I am aware that there's a um, a long list of, of members waiting to come in after me and I have noted your names and I will be calling you in order. So I'm just looking up the um, rights of way map on the Dorset Explorer. Right. I, I tell you what I might do is leave you because we are spending time here um, on um, a particular question, which Simon can come back and answer when he's found it. Could we now move on? And I will now um, uh, leave you 
are you nearly there, Simon? If not, yeah, I will. I, I do have it. Sherry, right. yeah. Good. Well, thank you very much. Good. Share screen again. Thank you. Okay. Can you see? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So the green footpath here is the N3520, which is the footpath uh, referred to, which is just to the north, um, which comes off the junction of Greenway and Haywards Lane. So yeah. that that is what the contribution is for. Right. OK, OK, so it does not link. It's not linking to this site. Not that not directly, but no, it's in that's 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 very clear. Thank you very much. So we're not just so we're clear. We're not talking about a new um, a new footpath from this site to any footpath. These are footpaths that already exist nearby that that um, will be improved. That's very helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, um, could I ask now, David Taylor, you had a question to ask. Yes, certainly. Haywards Lane, can you clarify for me, please, the speed limit on Haywards Lane? Is it still going to be 60 miles an hour? Shall I clarify that, Chair? Yes, please. The, um, the existing speed limit is the national speed limit as it comes from the west, from the Shillingston direction, and it changes to 30 mile, miles per hour just effectively on the western boundary of the site. The speed limits will be remaining as they are. Okay, fine. Uh, just to request the fact, it's like the car park that's in the development proposing is for people to leave their cars to go to the school. So that means they have to cross that road whenever possible, and would there be problems with traffic otherwise? Well, again, um, councillor, the pedestrian point which they've um, they're proposing, we deem there to be sufficient visibility. It's a safe distance to cross. It has or will have, if it's approved, the appropriate tactile crossing for people with protected characteristics, etc. So we we are satisfied that it is it is a safe position and it's uh, ideal, obviously, for people to cross there. Yeah, sure. Chair, can, Chair, can I come in on that point, please? Yeah, sure. Yes, please. Uh, I, I need to stress this is an indicative layout that parking area uh, does not have to be a part of the detailed layout no. at the later stages. No, th that's very that's well reminded because I'm but, going to come back to that. But the, there is still a pedestrian crossing proposed for there, Steve. Indeed, and that's what I was going to clarify, Chair, yeah. is that the application before you is for points of access to the site. It's a vehicular access and a pedestrian access. And as I explained earlier, we feel the pedestrian access provides the permeability and the necessary crossing to the footway section along the southern side of Haywards Lane. So it is essential to this development. And That's just right. so we all know, the pedestrian access is that crossing the road where it is 60 miles an hour or 30? 30 mile per hour, Chair. It, that's within the 30 limit. Indeed. But that's only perfect. just, only just. Yeah, well, drivers, yeah. if they're driving accordance with the highway code, should be doing 30 miles per hour when they get to the 30 mile per hour speed limit, Chair. In in your world, Steve, I will. Well, thank you. In the ideal you. world, I'm not saying it's mine, Chair. Yes. OK, <laughs> thank you. Um, David, is that the extent of your questioning? Yeah, this is my concern about the fact of speeding, which people do do. And the yes. thing is that the, the protection of the ch children and adults of, of walking there. That was what yes. my concern was. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Matt Hall. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, it's really to follow on from Councillor Taylor's question. It's um, why are we not asking for the 60 to 30 mile an hour boundary to be moved further up the road? And is there any reason why we are not using this as an ideal opportunity outside of a school to reduce the speed to 20 miles an hour? Thank you. Ooh, yes. oh, I'll answer that one as well, Chair, if you'd like. Yes, please. The, um, there's no proposal within this application to change the existing speed limits. Uh, the transport statement and the technical note which looked at the car park and did not identify again a need for the speed limits to be changed and as you are aware the process for um, speed limits falls outside the planning process itself. Traffic regulation orders are carried out under the Highways Act. This is separate and it's not that normal to type uh, a requirement for this for a planning application. 
if the town council or the village or the parish feel that there is a problem with the car parking and a problem with speeding along here, they would need to approach the council on the, in the normal fashion to petition them to get the speed limit changed. It would require the support of the police, of course, to do it and, the, and to ensure that they feel they could enforce matters. But just to clarify, there is no proven need that the speed limit needs to be altered as part of this application. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. And that absolutely um, addresses a, a core question here as to why that was not part of the planning application. It's because it's not a planning matter, um, uh, but, but it is, of course, a matter of grave concern to the residents of Child Oakford who have um, long been trying to get the 20 mile an hour extension in their village extended. I know that because I live there. So, um, but it's not a planning matter, so it's not something we can help with today. Um, Councillor John Andrews. Thank you, Chair. Um, a few of my questions we've got answered. Uh, firstly, it's quite an easy one. Uh, has Child Oakford got a neighbourhood plan and is the North Dorset um, local plan still valid? No and yes. No. Have you answered that or is an officer answering The answer, answer. no. Well, well, I think the officer will answer. And, and yes, it is still valid. Robert, you want to expand on part two of that, perhaps? Well, not really. It's your answers are correct, Sherry. Okay. No, they don't. They do have a village design statement, yeah. though. And um, within that design statement, they did address um, at, I think it's called CO12. Mm -hmm. uh, Simon, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but that part of the village de design statement says new dwellings should safeguard the spatial characteristics of the locality, be of a size appropriate to their plot and the character of the surrounding area. Uh, and be within the, the settlement boundary, to be fair, I think that's... No, okay. well, it doesn't say that. Oh, all right, spatial, I, I stand It says the spatial I, characteristics and um, in as the local plan doesn't have a five-year housing land supply, we can't give full weight to right. the policies of the local plan, which would normally restrict uh, development in the countryside. So the next step is looking at the suitability or the sustainability of individual sites and um, an officer's opinion. Uh, this fits a bit like a jigsaw puzzle a piece to the village of a child Oakford as it shares the boundary. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, okay. thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so that was the first first yeah. question. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much. That That's a perfect answer because um, we had a similar situation in Sherwood. Um, uh, I understand in one of the objectors, um, I, I know it's, it's not really these matters, so I won't even say it, uh, but I'd just like to remind everybody that this is an access statement and not about uh, reserve matters at the moment. You know, so right. it's just, is, it, is this site at, you know, can you access this site? Because we're getting stuck down in in, in questions that we shouldn't be stuck down in. Thank you, Chair. Uh, next, thank you. Um, Tim Cook. Thank you, Chair. Um, coming back, I think maybe follows on slightly from where John was going on this one. Maybe, maybe not. Um, uh, it was mentioned towards the beginning of the objector's statements um, that this is rounding off of the settlement boundary and I think possibly uh, going back to when the um, case officer was uh, giving us his view of the whole development. Rounding off of the settlement boundary. Now this raises real concerns in my head and especially I think maybe for those members that do live in countryside and rural areas and or represent countryside and rural uh, wards. Um, this history of rounding off, I'm sure, has been been evolving as villages and smaller towns do evolve. Um, but unless we start looking at the, the wider effects of settlement boundaries, I think we run the risk of going against what I think in one of the objectors um, comments was the essential rural character of Child Oakford. Um, it was mentioned a moment ago that this maybe is like a jigsaw puzzle. Now, I don't know whether members remember the game of Tetris where you had pieces just dropping down and having to be fitted together. I feel that sometimes we are put in a position where we have 
pieces of land that have been identified either by, by, for speculative development or coming forward from the lack of five-year land supply, which I do understand is a driver. But I feel that sometimes we are asked to say, this is an access statement. Can this develop or can this piece of land support access for development? And and I feel that the cart is always being put before the horse in that situation, and that we are continually looking at pieces of land that should be um, that could be developed purely from the fact that oh it fits in nicely with us with somebody's idea of of how the how the community could develop and that actually the community that is going to be developed are the people that don't get the 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 say in whether that development should go ahead or not on the basis of that we are looking at a development just on access only and I feel that again in this case looking at the wider picture of Child Oakford as I am on, on Google at the moment there are so many small pieces of land that could have this um, application put forward and as a result of that then the land and the essential rural character of the village will definitely change and I think it was made I'm not sure whether again in in the uh, objectors comments or the officers comments I think it probably was the objectors comments one of the reasons that people come to villages like this or specifically for the people that do live in the villages like this is the rural character and I feel very strongly that this small development will set a wider precedent and I'm minded to not support it on that basis. Thank you Chair. Thank you very much indeed Councillor Cook. Councillor Chair, Wright, yeah, so, Chair yeah, uh, yes. there weren't any questions asked there no, uh, there would, weren't. You like me, would you like me to come back on some of the points that were raised? Um, there weren't any questions. Can we, can we press on and then you yep. come back at the end, yes. Robert? Because yep. yes, if, if in yes, uh, Councillor Rideout. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Belinda Rideout, Gillingham. Um, I've looked at this and through the report. I, we're being asked to consider up to 26 dwellings on this site and looking at the proposed access. But could I ask, um, in the report, there is um, there are objections raised by the landscape architect, November 2019, yeah. based on the higher density of 30 dwellings per hectare. What are the landscape architects? Um, what are their views? please, on the lower density of 26 dwellings. Thank you. Could, um, uh, planning officer, if you'd like to respond to that one, please. Simon, do you want to pick up on that one? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, Belinda. Um, Hello. Yeah, it's right that there was an objection raised um, early in the process from the landscape officer, um, and that was when the proposal was at up to 32 dwellings. Um, I believe that landscape officer is no longer with the council and therefore didn't have the opportunity to comment on the reduced proposals which went down to 26 or up to 26. Um, so, so there is no new comment from the landscape officer. There was comment from the urban designer who raised no objections um, and we officers were were um, satisfied that the reduction in the amount of units to a density down to about 20 dwellings per hectare was reflective of the landscape character and the adjacent properties uh, nearby. So although that objection still stands because there wasn't an updated one, um, I would have liked to have thought that had um, a landscape officer commented, they would have perhaps removed their objection in light of the reduced proposals. 
Councillor Ryder, do you want to come it, back on that? Well, it would have been useful to have an updated response from the um, landscape architect because this is beautiful countryside we're talking about, and I think it's very important. Yes, thank you uh, very much. Um, Chair, Councillor Pipe. Chair, if I may. Yes, yes um, Robert. I know the councillors will have to rely on the written word, um, <clears throat> what, what there is or isn't. Uh, but I had walked uh, this site with the landscape officer and the previous case officer, and we had considered um, this site and a couple of others from Hambleton Hill, and we walked around the area. Uh, I know that he was, um, unfortunately, he didn't have time to um, write up the his comments, but the reason the number is there at 26 is from his advice in informal discussions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, um, Robert. Um, Councillor Pipe. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, let's not uh, sort of lose sight of the fact that this 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 whole application is, is a, as a result of the former North Dorset District Council not having secured a five year land supply. And you will get these, as we all know, these applications, whether they be speculative or not. Now, it seems to me that it's a natural rounding off of the settlement boundary and it fits in well, is inconspicuous, has no loss of view of the surrounding countryside. Tree preservation orders have been put in place and has additional planting planned and the removal of hedges for access is quite acceptable. On the numbers with 40% affordable housing um, available for local people to buy, or will it all be snapped up by housing associations, uh, which 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 seems to be the normal practice on these uh, smaller, uh, medium sized uh, developments? Will local people actually get the chance to buy one of these houses or will they only be able to rent them from a housing association that sneaks in through the back door with the estate agent and, and buys the whole lot? Hi, Councillor Pipe, um, I'll, I'll take that one on. No, Robert. Yeah. Uh, Simon here. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, Simon. Hi, good morning. Um, th there will be a mix of affordable dwellings on the site. There'll be a proportion of houses that people can, can buy under a shared ownership type scheme, and there'll also be a proportion of social rent. And there'll be a clause in the section 106 which restricts uh, these dwellings to, to local people, people with local connections. Um, so, so so no, they won't all get snapped up. There will be some that remain available in perpetuity for local people. I'm very pleased to hear that. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Any, any further questions, Councillor Pipe? Uh, not from me, Chairman, thank Councilor you. Councillor Robin Legg. Hello, um, I've got several questions. Uh, first thank of you. all, um, so, and this is really a, a question from me as a person who wasn't previously a member of North Dorset's planning committee, but came from a different authority. Some authorities don't actually charge anything in relation to the affordable housing element of a development. So when you talk about £16,000 a house as a kind of cash benefit, is that coming from every house, including the affordable housing? That's my first question. Uh, Robert or Simon? Uh, the simple answer is yes, all of the houses will pay a contribution. And that's policy? Yep. Okay. Yes. okay. Thank you for that. Um, the second one really is to try and understand the status of the village design statement. Um, as part of the, part of the um, introduction to this uh, uh, item, we had a picture taken from the end of Allen Close showing a very um, attractive rural view and then later on there was a slide which showed how a, a view would be preserved but clearly um, the view that will be preserved by development as shown in the kind of outline scheme is nothing like as attractive and, and couldn't possibly fulfill the design statement um, which has been approved by the parish so does the, I mean, I'm, what I'm trying to understand is what weight should we give to the design statement in reaching a decision? Is it something which is trumped entirely by the fact that we don't have a five year land supply? Robert. 
Would you? Thank you, Chair. Uh, my the short answer would be no, um, in that with uh, the shortage of a five year housing land supply, if you look at the MPPF, after two years, um, the the weight you give to a neighborhood plan, which this is not, it's a design statement, uh, would diminish or fall in line with um, the decision makers giving less weight uh, to policies. Wow. So. I would recommend that um, members give some weight, but limited weight to the village design statement. And as I said earlier, the the village design statement doesn't preclude new development. As a matter of fact, at CO12, it says new development should safeguard the spatial characteristics of the locality. Now, what Simon has done in his presentation and the applicant has done is provide a landscape and visual impact assessment and demonstrating the important views uh, of and over the site. So the site is not in a conservation area. Um, it's adjacent to the settlement boundary and when viewed in the context from the important sites, it was officers consideration that uh, it wouldn't have a significant harm. Thank you, Chair. So just, just listening to Robert's answer, does it mean that uh, in terms of the design statement, that uh, recognizing the spatial characteristics of the area, is that satisfied by a outline proposal for 26 units? Because arguably, I think from listening to some of the objections that have been read, it might be thought that a, a much lower density would recognize the spatial characteristics of the of the village, whereas 26 might be thought to be too many. <clears throat> I appreciate the fact that the, the number of, has already been reduced as a consequence of the landscape officer being involved. Uh, Chair, it is yes, a matter for interpret. Wrong. It's a matter for interpretation. Simon, could you go to a, a slide that shows the wider built context here? And officers have, you know, and, and it is officers' opinion. So members will take their own opinion on on this matter. But when you looked at the ordinance survey map showing the development in the area, uh, the density that's being proposed here is akin to what is surrounding the site as is. So it would be a difficult argument to say that this density is too high. As a matter of fact, that's the precise reason why the landscape officer previously said. Uh, that's too high, 30 was too high, and we've gotten down to up to 26. Now it is an up to figure, up to doesn't mean necessarily 26. If at a later date, it's an awkward relationship issue and you think it should be 25 uh, to remove a house here or there, you're at liberty to do that in an up to figure. And officers, of course, would be pressing for a quality layout and design in relation to the character of the area. Mm. Thank you, Chair. Can we do, but we can't do that at this point, can we, Robert? No, there's no need because what you're approving is just the principle of right. development there. It, these are reserved matters issues. Yeah. Um, and we'll be talking about reserved matters with the next application um, yeah. that we see today. Good. Okay. So that's clear. So, 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 um, if the committee decide to approve this application, we have only approved it up to 26, but we might um, at reserved matters have a discussion of fewer than 26 if that's what we, if that's what came forward or that's what we wanted. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, at the layout stage, if you're yes. not satisfied that the layout um, is uh, or it exactly. looks too too dense, or it doesn't. You know, if the character is being harmed because they're <laughs> uh, they're they're going for twenty six, then you could say, well, no, we don't like that. Actually, you should remove this house. You'll have to have good reason for it. Yes, of course. But it's, it's, um, as it as demonstrated in the illustrative layout, there's certainly sufficient space for twenty six plus a car park. Now, if you, like, if you get rid of that car park, you could also have more day. space. I think that's that, yes, that's helpful. Um, the I've got if I can uh, yes please carry on may carry on um <clears throat> you, you've mentioned the car park um and I know we've had a uh, thank thankfully as a result of the chairman raising it earlier um some very helpful responses in relation to that but uh as the section 106 is to be negotiated and and benefits from uh 
planning gain as a result of the development is something on the table to be negotiated with the landowner. Um, isn't it possible as part of the planning gain through the Section 106 agreement to actually specify um, what the village wants in terms of car parking or drop off space for the school? Is there any reason why that shouldn't be included in the 106 negotiations? And if I may, just one final point, because it was raised by the parish council in their objection, that they referred to a planning appeal, which is current, where uh, Dorset are arguing uh, against the, the the sort of run of of um, five year land supply and saying that the site, that particular site shouldn't be developed. That was something, <coughs> excuse me, which I was unaware of. And I just wonder what relevance you feel that that's got in terms of an argument for, for a delay, because one of the things they argued for in their objection was that there ought to be some uh, slight delay in consideration of this application. That Those are my final points, Chair. That's, that's, that's helpful. Robert, would you like to, yes, it, that point was made by the Parish Council about deferring this application pending um, the outcome of a, an appeal of a site elsewhere in the village. Robert, very quickly, would you just like to um, clarify the relevance of that? Uh, certainly, Chair. Um, I would not um, advise the members to defer simply to await another decision like that. I think you would be in risky, uh, risky waters there. Uh, when the other site and the merits of the other case are significantly different in my own opinion. Yes. The other site has a, a large um, agricultural building on it. It's uh, separated from the, the designated settle, settlement boundary, so it is technically in the countryside as opposed to this site which shares the boundary with the settlement. So you can see there is significant difference on the merits of the case. Um, I would also say from my walk with the landscape officer uh, that the views from Hambledon Hill are significantly different as well uh, between these two cases. So the merits of, of the cases are um, shouldn't be shouldn't be mixed. And uh, I would also suggest that uh, members consider or some members may recall other uh, villages where we've had speculative development. Um, I think early on in this committee it was Huntley Down and Huntley Down it was a, a site a, a, immediately adjacent to a village. There were no landscape constraints per se uh, and that ended up going through three different renditions and an appeal and the inspector basically came back to us and said uh, subject to the neighbor relation issues it was okay and we consequently um, uh, approved that, that development. So dealing with spe speculative applications is never easy, but until we get over a five-year housing land supply, the weight that you can give to policies uh, must be reduced uh, and th the weight you give has to be uh, justified. D does that answer your question, Councillor Legg? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Pothecary. Thank you, Councillor Pothecary. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my question really has to do with the principle of access and um, suitability of the site generally. Um, given uh, what I would like to see, if it's possible, please, was the picture of um, Haywards Lane looking east. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, given the question mark over the pedestrian access to Allen Close, I'm concerned about the safety of walkers to the village shops and amenities. Um, they're somewhere between 75 and 100 occupants of this site, and one would hope that they would walk to go and get their newspaper, etc. I don't consider that um, lane very safe. 
we've got um, no pavement or, or dedicated footway, um, which is, to be honest, it, make, it puts a question mark over whether um, whether this development would be sustainable. Thank you. That's really all I've got to say. That's very helpful. Simon, do you want to comment on that or Steve? Oh, Steve, please. I'll comment, Chair, if that's OK. Um, the view that you see there, Councillor Pothcree, is basically um, the western end of the site. As you come into the assessment, you hit the 30 mile per hour limit. The actual access, the pedestrian access itself, it's hard to make out on there. But if you can see the car, which is on the left hand side of the road driving into the assessment, it's probably just past there. Uh, Simon, could you show the, um, the drawing that shows the pedestrian access? In fact, that's a good drawing. The pedestrian access is effectively to the right hand side of the silver car that you can see there. And the intention is they formed the pedestrian access with the tactile crossings and the like. And then on the other side of the road where you can see the grassed area, and there's also the concrete drive that Mr Kerridge referred to, that grassed area will be subject to an improvement which will provide a footway and then another tactile crossing point across the school access there. So in answer to your question, um, there will be safe access from this site because we've got the pedestrian access as close as we can to the existing footway, which has then been extended across the school entrance to meet with that crossing point, as you can see on the drawing there. So we're confident that there are no safety issues with regards to pedestrians because they walk in the shortest possible distance to get onto the existing facilities on the south of Haywards Lane. Thank you. Can I come back, Chairman? Yes, please. Um, so now I understand about the crossing. Um, so uh, are you telling me that there is a, an established pavement between um, the school side of the road up through to the village so that people can walk safely? No, no not the whole route. Well, not the whole route, but where you can no. see on the right hand side of the access where they've got the proposed pedestrian tactile crossing points, that area to the right is the footway, the current existing footway. So it does link to the existing footway facilities. Of course, as you go through the settlement itself, the there is no footway, but it does operate as a shared surface and it is subject to a 20 mile per hour speed limit. Just, just for the absolute avoidance, Sorry. there is a small amount of pavement around the school and the bus stop. There is no pavement at all up through Haywards Lane, nor up through um, Station Road into the centre of the village. And there's no pavement at all there, Councillor Pothcray. Thank you, Chairman. And yeah. I, you know, given the extra um, people that will be uh, occupants of the homes walking this distance regularly, I just have very great con grave concerns, actually, as to their safety. I, obviously, we, that's the status quo at the moment, but nobody lives down there. So, um, you know, that this is going to make a huge difference to the safety of people walking along there, which may exist at the moment, but it's not being used very much. Sure, can, again, sorry, can yes. I just come in there again? It must be remembered, Council, that the school is immediately opposite this site and it is currently accessed by pedestrians. Mostly, yeah, thank you. Um, Council Jones, Carol Jones. Thank you very much, Chairman. I just wanted to make a few points. Um, first of all, with regards to the village design statement, that was dated 2007. So my own thought is that, you know, at 13 years old, that should only give limited weight. Um, this is only outline. It does give 40% affordable. Um, and I do fear that, um, I think that the fear of development is always greater than the reality of a finished lived in site. Personally, I think a car parking site there would be very welcome. I have driven up and down that road many a times at 3.30 on my way to a different school to, to volunteer for something. And there's always an awful lot of parking either side. Now, I would say that perhaps the residents of the village might not feel it necessary, but I, I think, well, actually, the school might well feel it's necessary because a lot of their children are coming from out of the out of the village, which means their parents have to drive. So they do want to park and, and drop their children off safely. Um, in terms of walking up and down the lane, there are occasional walkers, but the main area for walking is right at the bottom of Haywards Lane, where you've got the trailway, where there's a car park, and that's where most people tend to stop, park and walk from there. They don't tend to walk from that area right up through the village. 
So I can't see any reason why this um, application cannot go through. It's it's sound. And the slide we saw a couple of slides ago shows that it really is quite a perfect sort of infill site there, really. And we don't have a five year housing supply. So on that basis, Chairman, I'd like to move the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Les Fry. Uh, Thank just you. Before, just sorry, just uh, uh, nobody's answered your question about with regard to the school. Um, just for, for the avoidance of that, the school have indicated no support. They have not said that they want this car park at all and they haven't um, uh, asked for it and they haven't indicated support for it. Just, but just for the for, for clarification, Councillor Fry. Thank you. I'm just looking at um, a Google Maps at the moment. My question is how much weight should be given to the fact that it's outside the village boundary? Um, if that could be answered, please. Yes, please. Um, uh, uh, Simon. Councillor. Yeah, Robert. I'll take that, Simon. Thank uh, you. Councillor, the only thing we can tell you, uh, since you're the decision maker here, is for you to give weight to it. Uh, we, we would only say that you shouldn't be giving it full weight and you should be assessing other matters such as the sustainability character of the area um, for uh, reasons why you wouldn't accept this development. So um, the the sole reason for it being outside the settlement designated boundary uh, would be very thin ice for us to defend at an appeal stage. Thank you. Robert. Can you, what, so you what, is the, what is the value then of the village boundary on this? And I'm looking at the village on a map and Child Oakford is quite an extended village. It's of a, of a an odd shape, if you want to call it that, the way it's evolved over the years. Yeah. The value of the designated settlement boundary uh, comes more into when we have a five year housing land supply. As I said, it's still relevant. It's just we have to give it less weight and we need to be opening up our vision of where we can accommodate growth and accommodate housing that's both appropriate for the village and the countryside. Now, I would on this point, I would also say we have other villages that have taken on um, extensive growth, maybe even too much. And, and at that point, we're starting to push back as officers to say um, in in appeals that we're defending at the moment that this village has already approved X amount of housing. And um, whilst we acknowledge the sustainability of the location, the village has already delivered a, a lot of housing. That's not the case here. Child Oakford hasn't delivered any housing. We've, we've gone through the arguments of character and appearance, safety of access, uh, sustainable sustainability, and they all rate very high with this application. So um, settlement boundary is something that I, I would only recommend you give a limited weight to. Thank you very much for your answer. Anything further, Councillor Fry? No, that's answered my question yes, very I helpfully. Have, Thank you. I, I have nobody else indicating at this moment that they want to speak. I have had a proposer and a seconder um, uh, that we um, uh, support the officer recommendation. Before I do that, uh, committee, if you would bear with me, um, but this is my this is my ward, and so I do know it in some detail. And I would like to ask if the committee would allow. I am um, there is a massive amount of concern about this car park, and I think it's included in this um, outline in this. Uh, uh, outline application for access in a way that could prove quite unhelpful in the future. What I would like to do then, if, if you would allow me, if you would agree, is to put an informative note, something to the effect that the evidence available at the moment does not support the inclusion of a car park or a school drop off port, port point in this residential application um, because I think it would be most unfortunate if we were to agree this with the car park wrapped up and then a later planning application is then stuck with this car park. If we if we include the phrase at the moment, 
if when an application comes back to us later on a full application the case is made for a school drop off point or a car park then by all means let's have it in there but at the moment there is no evidence of community support no evidence of need no proven demand by the school and I believe this car park has the potential to be a to become a bit of a liability for the village because it hasn't been really thought through enough. So, so I I would like to propose this informative note. Is there is there anyone who would um, uh, uh, agree with me? Uh, um, uh, Councillor Fry, you're you're wanting to come through on the car yeah. park. Yeah. I, I'm at a, at a loss because I'm aware of the issues that generally take place around schools and the people and the random car parking. So I see this as a potential asset to the community. I appreciate that ownership, responsibility and liability need to be um, resolved. But to, to, to have cars parking in that area, whatever the eventual layout may be, rather than on the side of the road, surely has to be better. So. I appreciate this is an outline application and I'm not but I'm not aware of the comments against the car park. So perhaps you could fill us in a bit, a bit about that. But I see it as an asset. Oh, all right. Well, the community really don't. They see it as a liability. They are concerned about who's going to own it, who's going to maintain it, who is going to manage it. The school have not asked for it. The, the thing we need to understand, colleagues, is if Dorset Council were building a new school, they would not be including a school drop off point or parent parking as part of that plan. That's not what Dorset Council does when we build a new school. And it seems to me if if the school needs a car park for its teachers and so on, that's not the responsibility of the village of Child Oakford. The school, to be fair, haven't said that they need this car park. I, th I think that we, we the car park isn't part of this um, um, application at all. And I'm just trying to be helpful to the local community to, to get it nailed down so that the car park doesn't go forward, as it were, automatically. If, if in a later date a case can be made for a car park, so be it, but it hasn't been made at this point. And all the um, view of the local community is that they, they're very concerned about this car park. That's that's where I'm coming from on this. So I'm, I'm just trying to speak on behalf of the local community who have grave concerns about a, a school drop off car park in the middle of a residential application. Chair. Yes, if I may, you may. Uh, I just want to uh, again, state the fact that this is just an illust illustrative drawing. Um, the the points that you've made are relevant, and uh, at the layout stage, this can be addressed in full, as you're implying. We could impose, or not impose, we could add an informative to any uh, decision that says, uh, at the present time, the parish council does not see a need for a car park. Yeah. Um, and if a car park was to be uh, in the final layout, the 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 need would have to be substantiated. Would yes. that would that be suitable? That that so, would help me enormously. I would very much like to do this. Okay, that's that's something we can draft as an informative. Thank if, you very um, much. Just acknowledge that. And Good. on that point, if you are going to uh, make that sort of a statement, I would suggest that condition 12 Thank you. Of, yes. of the decision yes. needs to be yes. um, deleted. Exactly. And that yes. members should recognize that within their own uh, planning balance exercise, uh, that uh, they've considered that the development would still be suitable with or without the parking area. OK, yes, yes, thank you, thank you very much. So so we, we um, I have Carol and John who both said that, that they would like to um, propose this. Are you still happy to propose it um, with the given that we're going to put this informative in and so condition 12 will be deleted? Quite happy, Chairman. Thank you. John? Yeah, quite, quite happy, Chairman. Good. I therefore we have therefore got a proposer and seconder. Could we have the um, uh, 
recommendations up on the screen and then I will ask members to vote in turn. Recommendations on the screen, please, so members know we are reminded what we are voting about. No, all right. Uh, I, I hope members have the recommendations before them. I'm going to call you in turn and, and you will tell me you are for or against or abstain. Councillor Andrews. For. Councillor Cook. Abstain. Abstain. Councillor Fry. For. Councillor Hall. For. For. Councillor Jones. For. Councillor Legg. For. Councillor Penfold. Councillor Penfold? For. Uh, Councillor Pipe? For. Councillor Pothecary? Abstain. Councillor Rideout? Refuse. Councillor Taylor? Um, for. Councillor Jesperson? <coughs> I'm against. So that is carried. Um, Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We are now um, at the plaintive plea from some of our colleagues. They're going to take a 15 minute comfort break and we will reconvene then at five minutes past 12, five minutes past noon um, and uh, get on with our next planning application. Thank you very much indeed. Will that resumption be at a different uh, uh, meeting invitation or will we just come back into the old one? I think we, last time we just came back into the old one. OK, happy with that. Yes. Officers, can you confirm? Yes, I'll be coming back into the same meeting. I'm just yes. turning off thank my camera and microphone. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you.
Right, I think that's our 15 minute break. So officers, are we good to go? Yep. Thank you very much. Welcome we back. Are, Chairman, I'm sorry to interrupt, it's yeah. Helen. We've got a few members who haven't returned yet, I don't believe. Right, thank you. I, I will do a roll call. Um, we'll give them a moment. Let me have a look at the list and see who's not here. Right. <coughs> It might be easier to do a roll call. I'm going to do a roll call. I will do that. So welcome back to the reconvened Northern Area Planning Committee. I will now do a quick roll call of members um, and to ensure that we know who's with us. So, Councillor John Andrews. Yes, sir, Chairman, but I have a problem because uh, I have to be on the LEP scrutiny committee at um, two o'clock. Well, I have to be on before that. Um, and uh, considering the length of the first application, I don't know if I'll be here for the full application on this time because I have to leave. Right. If you have to leave, you have to leave. We uh, we will press on with you and you leave okay. when you have to. Thank, Thank you very you. much for indicating that. Tim Cook. Councillor Cook. Chair. Present Chairman. Councillor Fry. Present. Councillor Hall. Present. Councillor Jones. Present. Councillor Legg. Present, but like uh, like Councillor Andrews, I, I may have to depart before the end because I've got some caring duties for his disabled stepson. So, thank you, Councillor Penfold. Present, Councillor Pipe. Here, Councillor Pothecary. Present, Councillor Rideout. Present, Councillor Taylor. Present. Lovely, we're all present and correct. Thank you very much. Re moving swiftly on then to our agenda item 5B, which is a reserved matters application for 63 dwellings at the brewery site in Blandford, St. Mary. Robert Lennis, plan uh, Senior Planning Officer, you're going to present this uh, case to us. Over to you, Robert. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. I will share my screen. Thank you. And does everybody see that, please? It's on our screen, yes, thank you. If we could go. Bear with me just a moment here. I'm having my own technical difficulties. you see that uh, slide that says the planning application number? Yes. Right, and now I'm clicking to full screen. Do you see yes. that? Excellent, thank you. Well, uh, it's not doing what I want it to do, but um, I'll muddle through. Uh, so this is a planning application for the reserve matters uh, to erect 63 dwellings at an allocated site in the local plan, which is the old Blanford, the old part of the old Blanford Brewery. This slide shows you the stars where the site location is at. Um, half the site was assessed to be um, beyond the needs of the uh, modern brewery facility, so the site was allocated and has gone through a number of uh, uh, considerations with the local plan as an allocated site. You, the next slide shows uh, lot one is the red line site of this application. And uh, in the future, you will see applications coming forward for lots two to four. Here is a uh, aerial photograph of the site. It's a bit dated and you'll see in the next slide, uh, by chance I was on site yesterday, uh, for a different pre-application and 
these buildings here have been demolished and let me show you what the site looks like as of yesterday. So that's the back side of the old brewery with the chimney stack. And here's a photo of the rest of the site. As you can see, it's been cleared of, of, of buildings. Uh, this reserve matter application is considering layout, scale, appearance, and landscaping. So all the remaining reserve matters other than access, which has already been agreed. This is the layout and you will see that in terms of neighbor amenities, uh, the layout does a, a good job of staying away from the boundaries and we have no particular neighbor amenities. Uh, I have been on site to consider the concerns raised by this neighbor here and uh, they're back behind their house is a strip of land about a meter and a half. I don't even think it's two meters wide. There are no windows opening up there and it's not readily used as an amenity space. It's, uh, it's and the considerations on site would that would be that this site and these parking areas would not have a materially uh, detrimental impact on that pro property at all. Moving along, we then consider uh, appearance and scale of the proposal that's before you. There are a number of plans on on the file and on the website uh, to show you the quality of design that we're getting. These street sheen scenes um, show you what uh, we hope to be seeing or we will be seeing in the future. Uh, you'll notice that we have a, a couple different color of bricks and in terms of scale, this next slide, if you will consider the existing brew house building with the scale of other development, we find the scale to be uh, domestic and quite appropriate in relation to the surrounding area and the conservation area and other listed buildings nearby. This is the next slide, uh, image of one of the blocks of flats. Uh, you can see the, the quality coming through in the closer, the larger elevations. They've got arched brick two colors of brick um, and we're the we're pleased with the design. The applicant has worked with officers who especially the conservation officer to address our concerns. Uh, here is another a slide showing you both uh, the legend of materials that they're proposing and uh, the details that were we will expect to see on site. So you have um, both coins are on the windows, arched. Uh, it, it's a high quality development. And here is the gatehouse. Uh, another, this is a relatively matters uh, that I uh, addressed to some extent here and certainly extent uh, addressed in full in the uh, application are flood risk, matters of design, layout, scale and appearance which I've addressed, the heritage impact. We feel that uh, with regard to uh, listed buildings in the conservation area and the current state of the site that it would be a neutral to possibly even a be beneficial impact on the heritage in the area. Uh, with regard to flood risks, uh, you will have noted that the River Stour is nearby and there are some def defense works um, on the, the boundaries of this site. The Environment Agency and the Lead Local Flood Authority are both uh, satisfied with the proposal that's before you subject to some conditions and those have been attached to the uh, recommendation. 
other matters raised by local councils. You will have seen in the report an extensive section on that matter. Uh, we've tried to address those in detail in the report. Many of the matters uh, raised were matters of principle that have already been addressed with the outline applications and uh, certainly the matters with regard to the section 106 are not anything we can open up and renegotiate. Um, it is a large site that needs needed a lot of uh, remediation, removal of buildings uh, and what have you to bring it forward. So to make it a viable site, um, the, the negotiations were difficult back in the day. I wasn't the officer dealing with that, um, but um, the summary in the report is accurate and that's printed here again on screen. Uh, counselors, the I believe they've been carried out. The main access spine road you can see on the plan there, um, Stour Street, uh, that is subject to a forthcoming Section 38 agreement with Homes England. And this application only relates to the minor roads which lead off it, which you can see on the plan before you. Now, the developers indicated that these roads will not be offered for public adoption, they will remain private. But having said that, we have assessed them with regards obviously to highway safety and the highway authority is satisfied with the layout proposed. On-site car parking has been provided in accordance with the council's parking guidance and I did note that there are a number of objections from uh, the parish council for example who decided they didn't agree with the parking provision but I can confirm it is in compliance. Uh, the proposed estate road layout itself has been subject to a swept path analysis to ensure that both refuse and emergency vehicles can traverse freely and safely around it. So consequently, Chair, the Highway, support, the highway Authority is supportive of this application. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Steve. Um, uh, so we um, have uh, one um, uh, submission to hear. Um, on this one, and that is from the applicant. Um, who is reading this out? Is that Alison? Are you reading still for us? Are you still with us, Alison? Yes, hello. Okay. Steve Clark Savills, on behalf of the applicant, supporting. Thank you. Chairman and members of the planning committee. We are grateful for this opportunity to address you regarding the above application and welcome your professional officer's recommendation to approve the application. The application before you has been prepared and submitted by Drew Smith Holmes in partnership with Holmes England. Drew Smith Holmes are committed to the efficient delivery of new homes on this site which is allocated for residential development in the adopted North Dorset Local Plan Part 1. Approval of this application would enable delivery of homes on this site, which has been stalled since it was first granted outline planning permission in 2009. The application includes 63 of the 180 approved homes on the site delivering much needed housing to the area. It would also create a new pedestrian link through the site between Mortain Bridge and Blandford St Mary. The proposed development also includes the provision of new tree planting, high quality public realm and a local area for play. During the application process, the applicant has worked constructively with the Council's planning, conservation and landscape officers, responding positively to design issues raised via the submission of amended plans. 
The additional design features and details added to the scheme during this process has resulted in the officer's endorsement of the development as high quality within the committee report. The application benefits from no objections from statutory consultees. Specifically, the Highway Authority has considered the existing approved access from Bournemouth Road, the service vehicle tracking plans provided within the development and the parking provision, which complies with the Council's adopted standards to be acceptable. The Environment Agency has raised no objections on grounds of flood risk subject to planning conditions. The applicant would like to clarify that the proposed boundary of the application site is in the same location as existing boundary treatments and therefore the ability to maintain existing neighbouring properties would be unaffected by the application. The committee report addresses the key planning issues and provides a list of proposed conditions. These have been considered by the applicant and we hereby acknowledge agreement to the conditions as specified. Given the scheme's compliance with the adopted local plan and outline planning permission, we hope that you will endorse your officer's professional recommendation to enable the prompt delivery of these new homes that would make an important contribution towards housing delivery and addressing the lack of five year supply in the local plan area. If members of the committee have any questions, we would be happy to answer them on the day of the planning committee. That's all, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. And that's our um, only submission on, at, on this time. So presumably officers, you have nothing else you want to come back and answer just yet. Um, this is an interesting and important development. I said very significant for Blandford St Mary and the town of Blandford. So it's it's a most interesting one to have before us. I have a question already from Councillor Pipe about the listed building status. And then if anybody, other questions, if you'd like to indicate uh, on the chat. Uh, Councillor Pipe. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, were there any listed building status on the demolished buildings and are there any on the remaining buildings at all? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. No, most of those buildings were utilitarian additions that you would have noticed from the aerial view, the shiny rooftops. So those were uh, tin, well, you'll excuse the expression. I, I understand. Tin the, sheds. I understand uh, the, the, the demolished part. I. I, I see that, but on the on the uh, Georgian brewery building itself, are there any any status on those? Uh, it's within the conservation area. It's not listed, and the conservation officer has taken that into consideration. Um, but to be a direct answer, no. Okay, thank you. Have, Unusual, have you, but thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Tim Cook. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's just picking up on the point that was made earlier about the non-adoption of the roads. Um, does that cause us as an authority any issues? And secondly, um, if no, I don't, I've been looking through the report, is there any um, indication as to whether these properties will be leasehold or freehold? And in the in respect of any properties that are going to be freehold, has there been any indication from the developers as to the exact status of um, those buying? The the um, will there be any underlying ground management fees for any of the residents who move into freehold properties? Thank you, Chair. Robert. Uh, Chair, I, I, I'm having trouble with my screen, but it was set out in the report, the amount, uh, um, there, there aren't many, if any, affordable houses in this scheme. Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, the costs to remediate the site were extensive and 
uh, I think Drew Holmes is working with Homes England to provide some um, affordable homes, but it's certainly not a requirement of the outline planning permission. It wasn't specifically about affordable. It was it was actually about the freehold homes themselves. That if if they are provided freehold to private um, buyers, then is there any has there been any indication of any underlying management fee for the ground on which they sit? Um, to uh, as to whether it's a true freehold or whether it's a yeah, uh, those, those contract terms are not something the council normally gets involved with, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. So, oh, yeah, appreciate that. Uh, is that satisfied, Councillor Cook? Chair, would you like me to answer the issue about the adoptive highway? Yes, please. Um, the simple answer is, is that the obviously it's up to the applicant should they wish to offer the roads for adoption. Um, there's no compulsion upon them to do so. In this instance, they haven't. So the roads, the intention is the roads will remain private. They will need to be subject to a private management agreement and a private agreement will need to be drawn up with the DWP for waste collection. We've simply ensured that the layout that uh, they are proposing is safe and fit for purpose for all road users and specifically for emergency and refuse collection vehicles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's very clear. Councillor Cook, happy? Yes. Um, Councillor Legg, you have three questions. We'll take them one at a time. Thank you very much. Um, the first one really follows on from the question about uh, and the answer that was given in relation to the road adoption. Um, am I am I wrong, therefore, in thinking that the highway authority used to have and the planning authority too used to have a policy about the adoption of highways where a development was of a certain scale? And, and so it surprises me that you've got 63 houses here which are all accessed off private road. Am I, so am I, have I completely misunderstood what the policy used to be or did we have a policy and we've dumped it or? Uh, if I can answer that, Chair, I'm unaware that we ever had a policy to that effect. We obviously um, to offer roads to us for adoption. So as in this instance, if they choose not to, there is no policy in place which says that we can ever make them do so. So uh, just following on from your answer without impinging on my other two questions yes. so does that does it follow therefore that they could turn this into a gated community and and put gates up so that you so that the public couldn't generally get in there's well i think we're treading slightly outside the realms yes. of adoptive highway they can they could put in an application to erect a gate and our main um, response to that would be to ensure that vehicles could access the gate clear of the adoptive public highway safety that isn't what's on the table in front of us. We're looking at an application for a privately managed estate road layout. OK, thank you. Yeah. Um, my, my last two questions, what, what, one's for certainly for Robert. Um, as I understand it, the outline permission that's been given for, for this uh, development altogether is for 180 units. That, so that means in phases two to four, which is about the same size, there will be 117 units. Is that is that right? So they're going to be a much higher density or more high rise element on that on those other phases of the site. You're, you're Robert, that's that's correct. Yeah. Uh, the, your numbers are correct and your uh, interpretation is likely to be correct. Uh, in the context of the old brew house, that's I don't know how many stories high that is. Yeah. Uh, and and the existing the, re the remainder of the brewery site which is three four stories high um, you can expect the future development of on lots two to four to be um, three to four you know three stories high and okay. that's in the context it would be a, in my opinion appropriate subject okay. to design right and the, the, the final question is is about flood risk um, and I'm looking here from the website where the planning, um, all the planning comments are set out at uh, Gary Cleaver's response, which was given on the 19th of November. Mm -hmm. And if I now flip back using the other device to your report on page 69, where you uh, 
talk about the local lead flood authority, which Mr. Cleaver is a um, mm -hmm. one of one of your colleagues. Um, what surprises me a little bit about that is th the fact that I couldn't find a later um, email or piece of correspondence on the website other than the objection which he filed on the 19th of November and yet you're quoting that he's now satisfied. Um, I mean I think the whole issue is actually quite complicated because I, I, having looked at some of the plans I have to say I don't quite understand them so I'm a bit surprised a not to see his later bit of correspondence on the 19th of November um, expressing his now satisfaction with the, the further plans which have been filed by the applicant. So I, I've got a, a slight doubt as to whether um, all of the things which he flagged up as issues have now been satisfied. Robert. Uh, thank you, Chair. Gary, uh, Gary has been in the pre-applications and discussions all along with this, um, with this proposal. What you see in the report is fairly cl close to a quote or And that condition still needs to be discharged before they can commence development. And um, he's just highlighting that fact that um, he's he's satisfied with uh, with what's been being proposed, but that on the basis that they haven't discharged this condition, um, as long as that's understood, they have no objection in respect to the current application. OK, so you, you, you basically you're saying that the final main paragraph of his 19th of December correspondence where he starts by saying we previously acknowledged the difficulty of compiling a detailed design in respect to the total scheme when it has been subsequently agreed that a phased delivery is to be implemented. Um, you, you think that's all he's happy with that because of condition 23 on the uh, on the other permission? Yes, yes, as I said, Garrett, uh, Mr. Cleaver has been um, part of our discussions all along, so he's been at the table. Yes. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Councillor Leg? No. Good. Councillor Pothagri. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, firstly, my apologies. I was scribbling and I missed the response to um, Councillor Cook's question uh, regarding um, uh, car parking allocations. Actually. Um, there is a, a concern about adequate car parking allocation and I wanted to ensure um, that Stour Street and the internal roads are wide enough for cars to park along them if they need to while still being wide enough for emergency services and I seem to think that you I just came in on the end of that question but uh, could you confirm that that's the case please? Do you want me to answer that one Chair? Yes please. The car parking numbers proposed for this development comply fully with the council's guidance on car parking. Um, I have discussed with a number of members before our car parking calculator, which looks at it's an evidence based calculator, which puts various factors in play, looking at the reliance on the use of the car. Um, this uh, site has been assessed fully and, and as I say, complies with that. Um, I've could probably tell you how many spaces. Well, I think there are 103 spaces provided, 92 allocated to specific dwellings, further 11 are unallocated for visitors to use, and there is on street parking available. The sweat path analysis shows that the large service and emergency vehicles can obviously drive around the site, and people should not be parking where they're causing obstruction to the free flow of traffic. So, the simple answer, Councillor, is that we feel that it is compliant with policy and that the layout is appropriate for use by all road vehicles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. One more question, please. Yes, please. Um, I think there were concerns regarding children crossing the road to get to school. Um, could you please point out uh, where the school is in relationship to the development? Uh, Robert, can you show us that on the map? Yeah, I'll try to get the screen up and Steve, can you, I'll defer to Steve on that one. Um, if I can get this back. 
I think while Robert's looking for the screen, my recollection of the um, outline consents on this was were that we we obviously did fully assess the pedestrian linkages through to local facilities, including the schools. And my recollection is that um, there was a new pedestrian crossing being provided on Bournemouth Road in close proximity to the access. Thank you very much. That was the reassurance that I needed. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Councillor Poffordcurry. No, Councillor Rideout. Sorry. Thank you, Chairman. I'm just picking up on something I read in Concerns. It's reference disabled parking across the site. And I've been looking at this plan and I can see five disabled parking slots, but they seem quite random. Why is this? And some are actually outside dwellings, which I don't quite understand. Steve, disabled parking, random. They have a, a certain number, a percentage of uh, spaces that they have to allocate for disabled spaces and use. I think they've tried to scatter them across the site as best they can. We've little say as to exactly where the spaces will be going because, as I say, the layout is intended to be private. There is no hard and fast guidance here, Council, as to where disabled spaces should be located as such. So developers will normally put them in what they deem to be the appropriate sightings. Um, we have no issues with where they've put them. OK, thank you. Thank you. Can, is any other questions? Belinda? No, Councillor no. Hall. OK. Councillor Hall. Uh, thank you, Chairman. It's a question for uh, Robert, I think. Um, when I see a application that mentions French drains, I do get slightly concerned because um, they often need to be cleaned out and maintained. What are we doing firstly to make sure that any condition goes in to enable those to be cleaned out as much and as needed as possible? But also I question whether French drains in an area that is possibly prone to flooding is sensible rather than putting in a drainage system that actually takes the water away from the site. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, if I may. Yes, Robert. You will hopefully appreciate that this is uh, an exceptional site in its proximity to the River Stour. In normal circumstances in this floodplain, we would not be, I, I suspect we'd have strong objections from the Environment Agency and the lead local flood authority. However, this is an existing site that we're redeveloping, in which case um, we were dealing with the matters of flood to the best of our ability. and. On that point, I always defer to uh, the specialists in the lead local flood authority as well as the environment agency. So uh, if they're satisfied with what we've received thus far, um, then I, I would only concur with that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fry. Thank you, Chair. Simple question. What are the plans for renewables on this site? We are in a climate change situation um, and I'd like to see what, what the plans are for this site. Uh, Chair? Renewables? Um, I have not seen that addressed. Uh, what they will be doing is building to uh, uh, building, building regulation standards and um, to that extent, um, I suggest members of the public push for a change in building regulations to get that imposed. Thank you, Robert. I am yes, I'm aware that the, the plans do not include those important factors in this, but I would hope that the developers take that on board and make this a modern development and include renewables. There is space there for ground source places and also plenty of roof for solar panels, etc., and water recovery. So I hope they take that on board. It's a shame that we seem to be behind the curve on the, pl the government plans of, of making changes to buildings and developments. But thank you. Yeah, uh, Chair, on that matter, I, I do quite agree with uh, Councillor Fry. Uh, the other factor to for members to consider, and, and it's not an excuse, it's just to consider, is you're in a conservation area and close to other listed buildings. <coughs> so. Uh, design for uh, renewables needs to be appropriate when you see them. Thank you. Thank you. We, committee, we might like to put in a minute on the back of Councillor Fry's 
very sensible point here to the fact that um, we would hope that the, the developers would take th this being an important and interesting and significant development for the town of Blandford, we would hope that the developers would take every opportunity to um, make it also a modern uh, and sustainable development. We can just put that minute in. They can always ignore us, but it doesn't hurt to put the minute in. I, uh, I think, would you like us to do that, Councillor Fry? Thank okay. you, Chair. That would be really good if we can in every way and any time opportunity to push that. I think we need to be moving with the times and thinking of our planet. So, yes, please. Yes, exactly. And and then uh, uh, development such as this is particularly appropriate to make that point, I think. Um, yeah, I have Councillor Pothecary next. Thank you, Chairman. I would like to say what a very attractive development this is. Um, I can see a lot of work's gone into it. Um, I think it will sit well within the heritage of Blanford. Um, personally, all my concerns have been um, um, alleviated. I would like to propose approval of the recommendation. Thank you very much indeed. I have uh, Carol Jones next. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I do. I like the look of the development. I don't have a problem with it, but I do have a problem with the lack of play area. I think on a development of this size, it's disappointing that um, it it doesn't really go any way towards meeting a, an LEAP or a LAP or whatever. And I wonder whether we could do anything in conditions to ensure that at least it comes on in the next phase. Is that something we can do? I'd also like, I'm disappointed that we don't actually have any electric vehicle car charging points as well. Um, and I don't know whether this is anything we can sort of push a little bit further our end. Uh, Robert, first of all, the play areas. Thank you, Chair. I am here. Um, with the play areas, I think that would be a bit uh, difficult to... Um, it, it's already been established through the outline, so no is the short answer. I don't see us being able to um, uh, get any additional play area on site, but you should take a bit of comfort from the fact that uh, immediately adjacent to the site is a very large um, green open space. Um, there's a, a skateboard park here and uh, other matters um, relevant to the site. Thank you, Chair. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, is that it, uh, Councillor Jones, is that your questions? Electric car charging Electric point? Car Everything charging. we yeah. can do? At this point, um, we can add it into the informative that we're going to be adding on alternative energies generally. Yes. It's something that we do try to push as officers, but uh, the uptake is a financial issue for the developers quite often. Um, so yeah. I appreciate that we, we're pushing yeah. in the same direction. OK, yeah. thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, Councillor Pipe. Thank you, Chairman. Um, what are French drains? Ah. Excuse, please excuse my ignorance. That's all right. Uh, Chair? Briefly, uh, if you would, Robert. This is not a, um, an engineering seminar, but yes, carry on. Uh, um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, if you have uh, three different piles of brick or piles of stone, imagine one pile is very large stone, the next pile of stone is a medium sized stone and the next pile last pile is a very small s uh, size of stone or sand and you dig a trench and you fill them in I think it's large to small and then cover it up and when water comes into that area it percolates into the ground much quicker that's a French drain thank you very much it's thank God well, in England nice. thank you are you happy with that, Councillor Pipe? Yeah, I'm just pleased I live in England, Madam Chairman. Yeah, it's essentially a drain where the um, water soaks away as opposed to, partly soaks away as opposed to is carried away in a pipe to some other place. Can we, perhaps we'll have a training course on French drains at some later, later um, date. I've been suitably yes. educated. Thank you very much. Thank but you very much. I, um, I have no other, oh, no other, 
uh, questions or comments. We have had a proposed, uh, uh, Councillor Pothecary has proposed and Councillor Fry has seconded that we um, confirm this application. Uh, if nobody else is putting up their hands to speak further, I'm going to move straight to a vote. Excellent. Um, as I call your name, please indicate whether you support, oppose or abstain. Councillor Andrews. Support. Councillor Cook. Support. Councillor Fry. Support. Councillor Hall. Support. Councillor Jones. Support. Councillor Legg. Support. Councillor Penfold. Support. Councillor Pipe. Wholehearted support, Madam Chairman. Councillor Pothecary. Support. And Councillor Rideout. Support. And Councillor Taylor. Fully support. Excellent. Excellent. And I, I would just say um, that it is absolutely clear to us reading this report, the amount of work that has gone in by everybody, Robert and everyone else in um, bringing this um, application to conclusion. It's very gratifying to us members when we see an application come forward where we are not being presented just with the lowest common denominator um, style of housing. So thank you very much indeed for that. Yeah, yeah. Can we move on then? Our next agenda item then is agenda item six. Here, what we have nothing to decide on this agenda item. What we've been given is a verbal update on the Article 4 Directive, which you remember this committee considered um, some time ago for the treatment of walls and, and gates and railings in central Dorchester. So this is an update on that um, Article 4 Directive, an opportunity for you to answer any, ask any questions. I think, Robert, are you presenting this one again? I am, um, though my knowledge is limited on the matter. Um, I will try to share the screen and show you uh, how it's been amended by a map. Yes, thank you very much. So no all... trick questions for Robert. Thank you very and much. So do you see yes. for you the Article 4 direction map? Yes. Um, members may recall that uh, the public consultation went out um, the purple areas now have an Article 4 direction that will uh, hopefully prevent the loss of walls and gates within the conservation area. These are features that are quite important to character. And that's the extent of what, what I have for you, councillors. Um, okay. that, was, that was the area that we had. Are there any questions? Of uh, on this Article 4 directive for Dorchester. Dorchester councillors, uh, have you anything to ask? Chair, no, I've got nothing to ask or say. I think this is a useful thing to protecting Dorchester's in, um, heritage um, and keeping the town in a, in a way that we protect the valuable assets that we do have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Taylor. Yeah, one question regarding walls, if you go down Glide Path Road and you look towards the prison block, the wall is actually falling away from the prison block into, into the gardens. Right. That's been happening over the last two years. Has it? OK, that might be not necessarily for this committee, but I hope somebody is listening and makes a note of that because yeah. that's precisely the sort of thing that this Article 4 directive is designed to preclude. Thank so you. Thank you for that. Uh, has anybody got any other comments on this or should we just thank thank officers for um, undertaking this piece of work as requested by us? Thank you very much indeed. Good. Um, agenda item seven and urgent business. You'll be delighted to hear that there is none. So that brings us to the end of our meeting at 12.51. Thank you very much indeed. I now formally close the meeting. <laughs>